And we are live. Wonderful. Thank you. Admitting everybody. We are live. And where are you out? Oh, there you are. I'm going to pin you. Now you can start the meeting. All right. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to April's meeting of the Board of Directors for the Oregon Country Fair. I will start ceremonially with our singing bowl. Board of Directors for the Oregon Country Fair. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first up is announcements. Do we have any announcements? You can uh, add your name to the chat. All right, Tom, I see you first. Hi, well, um, welcome everybody. I, I just wanted to quickly let folks know, um, I've gotten to know John Alexander uh, as a board member and he works uh, with birds often as the um, executive director of the Klamath Bird Observatory and um, the focus on ecological monitoring and research in the Pacific Northwest and internationally. Um, and I would love it if John could speak to just very, very briefly, some of the work that he's doing actually at our Oregon Country Fair site for, for bird observation. John, is it okay to put you on the spot? Sure. I actually would, um, I want to talk about what other people are doing for birds at the fair, um, if I'm going to do that. And I talked to Aaron a little bit. Yeah, just real quick one, um, you know, peaches had a re really good recommendation that we take time at each board me meeting to celebrate some decisions that we've made and how we followed through on them and some of the other great things that we do at the Oregon Country Fair. And if y'all have made it out to Savannah do and seen the stewardship, the stewardship celebrates um, a, a lot of the stewardship that we do um, at the fair, uh, the vegmatics, the, the recycling crew, the archaeology crew, all of the different kind of cultural and natural resource stewardship we do. And a part of that is a bird crew that works out of um, the uh, quartermasters. And what the bird crew does is that they, um, and it's a good time to be doing that because springtime's coming. The turkey vultures just started coming through town down here and the spring migrants are arriving. And what the bird crew, Glenn Johnson and Aaron Holmes, um, do is they, while we build our fair and while we have our fair, look for active bird nests and address human bird conflict in a way that's really progressive and really learning, um, where anytime there's an active nest, they go out and they work with the people, whether it be in your booth or whether it be in your campsite or whether it be when you're building the fair to ensure that you're aware of the nesting birds and that you take responsibility for those nesting birds. Um, and sometimes that can, you know, feel like, uh, you know, this is where I've always put my tent or this is where I've always had my booth and now there's a bird nest here and it's interfering and it, it becomes a really good opportunity for progressive um, positive learning and really um, conflict resolution turned into really opportunities. We've seen families whose kids watch the nests throughout the fair. And it's just one of those little things that people do at our country fair to make it a better place and, and to lessen our impact and to teach each other and learn from each other. Um, we have a very active program and Aaron Holmes leads the nest searching part of it right now. And Glenn um, represents birds at the uh, 
at the stewardship, um, among many other things. And so it's just a great example of how we can come together with solutions, not obstruction, and, and take opportunities that might keep us from doing things, but instead they give us opportunities to learn more and learn how to do things differently, um, and sometimes even better. And so I, I, I think it's a really neat thing to celebrate as spring migration is coming and these birds are coming back to one of the last remaining old growth bottomland hardwood forests in Oregon that we um, have the responsibility to store. So thanks, Tom, for bringing that up. Appreciate that. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tom. Uh, next is Norma. Um, yes, I wanted to um, let everybody know that we're bringing back the spring fling. So after a four year hiatus, we're having the spring fling again on May 6th um, with a band, uh, what was the name of that band? High something. High Step Society? No. no. High Tolerance. It's, thank you, I, High yep. Tolerance, thank <laughs> you. It's at the Well Hall uh, on May 6th. So we hope to see you there and we'll have the raffle again like we used to, Benefit for Culture Jam. And um, we have some great prizes already and we're still collecting them. So we hope you'll join us. Wonderful. Thanks, Norma. Looking forward to it. Uh, Sue, you're next. This is a quick announcement for all the food booth reps. Food committee has sent you the digital blue sheets. They are to be returned by April 23rd. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Any other announcements? All right, next up is the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Would anyone like to move to approve those? I'll move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Arna. Second. All right, thank you. Um, minutes approval. Uh, a question has been brought by Arna, seconded by Paxton. Are there any concerns? Anything to discuss? All right. Um, I'll move down the list here real quick. Tom? You mean the list on the... Uh, for voting or... Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Sue? Yes. Thank you. John Alexander. Yes. Paxton? Yes. Arna? Yes. Anne? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Kevin? Yes. John Silverman? Yes. AJ? AJ? George? I'm staying. Okay. And Lisa? I was not present at that meeting, so I will abstain. All right. And AJ? AJ abstained in the chat. Ah, thank you. You know, I, I should abstain too because I actually was not present either. So all right, no. Problem. I read them. I read them, but I, I, uh, I, I don't know. So we'll go with that. All right. That is approved with four abstentions. 
Next is the agenda. Is there anything to amend on our current agenda? I see hands. Let's start with Arna. Um, I would like to table the personnel policies committee appointment to next month. Okay. Um, is this something that gets voted on? No, it's okay. no motion. That's, that was what I thought. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, next is Sue. Yes, I would like to move the new business item of the uh, logos to old business due to timing. Second. Thank you. That does need to be voted on right now, Al. That was my thoughts as well. Perfect. Thank you. So the motion is to move the logos topic from new business to old business and discuss it at this meeting. Is there any discussion you'd like to have? We'll move to voting. Um, Lisa? Uh, that's a, is that a yes or you have a question? Sorry, I was trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, yes. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, George? Yes. AJ? Yes. Thank you. Uh, John Silverman? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Ann? Yes. Arna? Yes. Paxton? Yes. John Alexander? Yes. Sue? Yes. Tom? Yes. Okay, that'll be moved to old business and we will discuss it tonight. <laughs> Thank you. And the next hand is Kirsten. Yes, I would like to request that Arna or Sandra table the potential conflict of interest uh, motion on the Ritzana as the contract is not finalized yet. As the motion makers, I need to ask for one of you to table that, please. I'll move to table that. I'll second that. I don't even have to do that. We're not voting on no, that. No, just need, just need one of you, one of you to make that. Just one of you to move to table it. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, are we ready to approve the agenda for tonight? Okay. I see no further hands. Um, we will continue to practice this. I will start somewhere in the middle this time. Uh, Anne? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Kevin, was that a yes? Yes, yes. Cool. Can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Yep, I got you. Thanks. Okay. John Silverman? Yes. AJ? Yeah. All right, George? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Tom? Yes. Sue? Yes. John Alexander? Yes. Paxton? Yes. And Arna? Yes. Perfect. Next up is uh, where we open up space for membership comments. Uh, anything you would like to say in this space, you're more than welcome to. Everyone has two minutes uh, to discuss anything you want. Uh, three minutes, thank you. Um, and as long as it's not on a topic that will be addressed later today, if that's the case, save your time and you can comment during that item. I will leave room there. So I will take hands here in this space for any membership comments. 
Kirsten. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I don't have access to the timer app right now. Um, so I will be keeping time on my cell phone. Normally I have a, you know, an app that I can use, but it's not functioning right now. So I apologize. We fully understand. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm assuming everybody's excited to talk about a specific topic tonight. I'll find out which one soon. Next up is the staff report. It looks like the executive director's report. Thank you, Al. Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. Um, we'll start with the financials. The Shuttered Venue Operators, operators Grant Closeout process is progressing, and all data has been submitted to confirm expenses by cost category. Monthly reconciliation training with Alex Zabala is going great. He is fully trained and doing an excellent job. So big kudos to Alex. Booth registration inventory income will be directed to Oregon Community Credit Union this year. Previously, it was directed to the Banner Bank account. Um, so that'll just make for easier reconciliation of that revenue stream. We have reviewed, I have reviewed and approved our 2023 slash 24 auto umbrella and accident insurance policies, which are effective April 1, 2023 through March 31, 2024. We have other policies that will be coming up down the pike. Um, we've renewed our safe, which is our workers comp insurance. We add autos around the event that we will, will increase our premiums, but we hold off adding those until just before the event so we don't pay for them all year long. Fair Care is on the agenda tonight. The Progressive Solution Policy um, will is on the .NET, and if it is approved tonight, it will go on the on the .NET site with a new email address um, called Fair Community Support at OregonCountryFair.org. We will publicize this email address, and it will be the main contact for the Fair community to use for help with interpersonal issues. This email address is a group email, and the support administrators will receive the, the request directly. We have placed an ad in the FFN looking for a new for new support administrators. We have received one that we are considering. We are also seek, we will be seeking up to three uh, support administrators. Uh, we will also be placing an ad in the FFN for investigators soon. Hybrid meetings, we're still kind of tabling that. I expect to have some information for you um, in the June board meeting. Um, so hang tight for that. Um, administration, I want to thank Anna Di Benedetto. Uh, for her first board min minutes that you guys approved tonight. Uh, excellent job, Anna, and thank you for your contribution. There is an on-site coordinator meeting scheduled for April 16th at 11 a.m. So mark that, there will be uh, email uh, blast reminding and inviting everybody to that, all the coordinators. We are still fine tuning the Four Winds database for 2023. Uh, I wanna remind everybody that there is a user manual on the .NET site under coordinator information. Uh, the database training that was scheduled for co coordinators on Wednesday, March 26th at 6 p.m. went great and was well attended. The 2023 guidelines are officially on the .NET site. They're going to the printers within the week and we expect to have them out around uh, the end of April. There's also going to be a booth rep page created on the .NET site, so uh, stay tuned for that. And we encourage coordinators to go to the coordinator info page regularly uh, for update and current uh, forms and documents and manuals. Um, so we did receive a lot of great suggestions from the coordinator uh, database training, and so we are uh, reviewing those for implementation, if not this year, then next. Uh, we did receive an insurance payment of $15,000 to begin the repairs on the what barn, uh, which received storm damage in December of 2022. Uh, we also just received another $3,000 that will actually fine, finish that uh, uh, claim. So since I wrote this and, and today, we actually received another $3,000. That was what the total cost to repair. We have a $1,000 deductible. So it's $19,000 to repair the what barn. Uh, we're still waiting on a... Um, approval for the repairs to the 420 tractor. Um, it received damage to its hydraulic fuel tank. Uh, we did repair it, uh, kind of patched it, um, but we're looking for a more professional, you know, full grade uh, repair on that. Um, we're still working on contracts. Uh, Honey Bucket's contract is in the final stages right now. 
Uh, the Ritz con uh, sauna is still pending. We signed the Whitebird contract a week ago. Um, we are still in communication with Verizon. We got contacted by them today for the Cow Tower, so that's exciting. Um, at and is done, or still pending, and T-Mobile is done. Mark is still working on equipment rental, but he's pretty much uh, hit our, our budget, and so he feels like he's got everything there. I'm working with Dodeca Art Barn, and that's still pending. LTD has decided that they cannot service the OCF in 2023. Uh, we don't feel that we're at the end of the rope on that one yet, so um, I don't want to say that this is not uh, uh, going to happen. So please stay tuned, but know that we're working diligently and we've employed um, uh, uh, Floyd Prozanski for his help in this. So, you know, he worked magic with the SVOG grant. So let's hope he can give us some help on the LTD and see if we can get that back in line. First student, which does our worker day shuttles, we're still working on that. Um, the flagging we're working on, the ATMs are pending, we've done the radios, and so there's, uh, what else do I have done? Dust control is done, the refrigerated trailers are done, um, and as I mentioned, the guidelines are going to print at the end of this week. Uh, per permits, we're still pending on our right-of-way permit, uh, the outdoor assembly is still pending, and Sierra is working on the camping permits. Um, the third coordinator's DEI workshop was held Tuesday, March 14th from 6 to 8. Um, this was the last of the three workshops, and it was well attended. The series focused on empowering the coordinators to create a vision for their crews and work with them to refine and implement the vision by closing the gap between where they are and where they want to be. So I look forward to doing more of those, not just with coordinators, but with the board and general membership as time allows. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kirsten. Appreciate it. Got a lot on your plate. Next up is the Treasurer's Report, Budget Report. I'll give a few things. Um, first, just to remind coordinators that they should have gotten their budgets by now. And I imagine some of you have already started working on spending things and contracts. And if you have any issues about the budget, um, please reach out. Your first stop would probably be your staff liaison. And from them, you can access anybody else that um, if there's a budget committee liaison or a bum that you need to talk to, too, that they can help you figure that your way through this. Um, the Right now, I am working with Norma and Kirsten on closing out the 2022, we're not going to start the 990 in review until after the fair, but the piece of it that I do is um, preparation for that. I calculate the depreciation. I capitalize the fixed assets that were and track the fixed assets, look over the restricted funds, kind of look at the re reconciliations and just kind of do a, a final bit of cleanup and then do the grouping schedules for the outside accountant. and. Um, Norman Kirsten have been extremely helpful on working on that, and that should be done by the end of this week. Um, I don't work full time on it. I just um, do little bits at a time. Um, the board, um, I think we'll send you a, a new balance sheet. Um, Norma and I today um, made a change to one of the transfers. If if board members look at their February balance sheet, they will see under operating accounts, a negative amount. And that actually is a transfer that came out of Banner Bank. So the total cash amount is correct. It's just that, that it hit the, the higher level account, but it didn't hit the sub account when the transfer was made. So we can we can resend you a balance sheet just so you see the actual account balances in the, the bank accounts. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, Linda, you got anything to add? Nope, nothing for me this month. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Uh, committees and work group reports uh, send their emails to Vanessa. And they get up on that .NET site. So that brings us to old business. The first one on the list is bylaws. Brought to you by Arna and Kevin. Um, so I changed the language a little bit in the motion. Um, so it's a little different than what you got originally. And I changed it after speaking with Lisa. 
um, about what would be correct wording for this. So, um, so here we go. I moved to direct the bylaws committee to develop the appropriate wording to amend the bylaws to require the president and vice president to be duly elected board members. Kevin. You need a second? Second. I do need a second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. All right, I'll open up this up for membership comment, if there are comments here from the membership. Spirit. Yeah, can we have that uh, re uh, or amended uh, motion typed into the chat, please? Uh, yeah, I'll put it in. It's basically the same, it's the same, the spirit of it is the same, which is that for um, office, the office of president and vice president must be held by board members who have been elected by the membership. Um, but I will type into here the exact wording. You have to give me a minute. Oh, not the Thank you. Thank no you. Yeah, I'll go up in there. Uh, yeah, Spirit, the idea is that um, we have the bylaws committee write it up. I appreciate it. I'm a visual person, so. I'll give time here for that to be spelled out. And you can tell me if I'm doing any typos here because I'm just, you know, here we go. Sometimes my typewriter does not do cues. This will be good for our minute take or two. I can give it in there, Honor, if you want it. I think this is. Okay, last word. Got it. <laughs> there you go. Oh, and hit enter. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Arna moves to direct the bylaws committee to develop the appropriate wording to amend the bylaws to acquire the president and vice president uh, or presidents to be duly elected board members. Uh, I want to give time for the membership to respond to this if they like here, uh, or do you have a direct part you'd like to add in, Lisa? Yeah, this is just to add a little bit more information because <clears throat> I think that the members might actually have this question, so I'd like to answer it before. Sure. Um, and let them save their time because <laughs> they get three minutes. Yeah. Um, so the effect of uh, a yes vote on this, if the board approves this motion, is that it will amend the bylaws to require that the president and vice president be duly elected board members. The change in language is just to direct the bylaws committee to draft that language. So the bylaws committee would take up the charge from the board, draft up the language, and then we would bring it back to the board for final approval. Um, and, and that's just what this, that's why the, uh, the, the motion wording was changed. I appreciate that. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thank you. Uh, back open to membership comments, starting with Spirit. Yeah, uh, thank you for typing that in. I didn't mean to put the pressure on you. Uh, I would say, uh, given this is a bylaw change, and unless there's some pressing issue that we need to worry about, what I would request from the board is that this is at least tabled. Uh, I appreciate uh, the energy of which this is coming from, but if we could at least table this, uh, considering it's a bylaw change, I would appreciate that. I always like to consider unintended consequences. Thank you. Thanks, Spirit. Jonathan Pincus, you're next. Yeah, um, 
Not to repeat, I concur with what Spirit just said. I encourage tabling it just so that more uh, members can be aware of it and think about um, the pros and cons. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next is Martha. I heard Lisa say two things, and so I just want to clarify. I heard her say that if this were passed, then the bylaws would be amended. And then I heard her say, if this were passed, the motion would be drafted and would come back to the board before the bylaws are amended. And so I would think if it's the second case, there wouldn't be any reason to wait, but the bylaws committee could get to work on it and people could be considering it before it came to the board for the actual vote. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Arna? Well, I, I should wait till the membership is finished. Okay. Um, but um, I would like to respond to a couple of those things when the membership is done. Sure. Are there any other membership comments? Okay, I will open it up to the board and we can start with Arna. Um, I don't have a problem with tabling this till next month, although it actually has been up on the .NET site for six weeks already because it was listed there. The original motion was to require that all, that the president and the vice president be duly elected board members. And then after thinking about it a little, I thought well, maybe that's not actually the correct language and after having worked with the bylaws committee for a while, I realized they have great wordsmiths and that um, there may be a more appropriate language. So I didn't wanna lock us into specific language. Um, so the intent of the motion has been up on the .NET site for six weeks, but if people feel they need another month, I have no problem with that because it's not urgent. I don't think Ke Kevin's nodding. I don't think he, <laughs> he doesn't have a problem. And you know, it's important that the member, it is a change in the bylaws and it's important that the membership, you know, really examine this. I think Lisa was saying, and Lisa will correct me if I'm wrong, is that if the board approves this tonight, they are improving the intent of this, that this is what we're proving, that the president and the vice president must be duly elected board members. The bylaws committee will come back with language the board could say, we don't like that specific language. You know, we're, the bylaws of community come back, yeah, to, for approval of specific language. And the board could say, I don't like that language, come back with some be, a little better language. But the intent is being approved tonight. Um, I want, I, I let, the reason I came up with this motion is that the president and the vice president, because the vice president can succeed the president and become president, they represent the fair to the outside world. I think it's important that the membership has chosen them um, and they're not just picked you know, out from someplace else. I get that our treasurers and our secretaries, I think they're better not being on the board because they have skill sets that you know, most of us don't have. And I think that it's important that there's continuity in those positions. But I really think it's important that the president and the vice president are chosen by the membership. And by being elected to the board, they are chosen by the membership. So that was my intent behind this motion. Thanks, Erna. But I have no problem tabling to two for a month. All right. Uh, AJ, you're next. Yeah, um, so I was just gonna say that uh, I like to see a time frame on this um, as well for the bylaws committee uh, to get that uh, back to the board before the next election. I think if um, it, it's important if we're gonna do this to do it um, before the election, um, so. Thanks. Kevin? Uh, yeah, thanks, AJ. That makes sense. Um, 
I want to say too, the same thing. We uh, folks won't sometimes think about that. Uh, totally fine with me as well. Uh, I, for me, with this motion, when um, Arda brought it to me as well, that we talked about it. Uh, I know the fair does things a little weird, and that's why we're all here, and it's, that's great. And so um, I thought this was weird, and I was like, well, um, I'm, I was interested in this conversation as far as why that's there, because it just feels uh, only like, um, only say that because, you know, it feels that it negates kind of the election process. Uh, it's like saying, Al, you know, go ahead and run. Doesn't matter if you get voted or not, we'll just bring you in. And so that was what seemed to make sense to me for the whole thing. But um, I'm definitely curious as to, you know, what folks have to say about it. So thanks. Is there any more discussion from the board on this topic? Uh, I see more hands here. John Silverman. So I, I don't know what the problem that this motion is addressing. Um, the membership are not electing the president. If you want the membership to elect the president, then you ought to have direct election of the president by the members. It is still the board electing, selecting the president and not the membership. It is the representatives of the members who are selecting the president, but not the members. The members select the members of the board of directors. On a very practical level, um, what happens if the board's unable to agree amongst itself which board member ought to be president? I can remember a board uh, election of a president uh, several years ago, uh, back when there was only requiring t uh, 10 voting members of the board, where the vote was six yes, three no, and one abstention. And the abstention later said that had they known that the abstention would not have counted, they would have voted no. So there would have been no board president elected at that time. And I sincerely doubt at that time that the board could have found a, a candidate amongst itself. I also think from my, my perspective that had Tom not accepted the nomination to be president last fall, the board would have had a very difficult time coming to an agreement on a candidate, on a president from amongst the other board members. Having the board have the ability to, if it finds itself in an impasse, to select somebody other than a board member, I think is an important option that I would not want to take away from the board. Um, is it better in principle for the president to be a board member? Sure. But if the board can't agree to tie its hands and say, you have to have someone president, it, 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 it would just create an impasse. And uh, we wouldn't have a president. And then whoever was vice president who happened to carry over from the previous year would probably become president. But then of course, if the terms are only one year, it would just be a mess. I think it's an important option to continue to allow. If you're gonna change it, um, I would want to make sure that there was some kind of clause that if the board was unable to reach agreement from amongst its members about who should be president, then it could select someone other than a board member. I might vote for it. Um, but uh, it, with, this, with this current wording, um, I, I, I don't support it and I'll be voting no. Thanks, John. Next up is Paxton. Well, I'm philosophically opposed to this. Uh, I've been involved in at least 30 years of discussions uh, asking this question at board retreats. And we've discussed and discussed it, and it's always come down that it's a good option to keep. Uh, uh, and I, I don't see the need to make the change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paxton. Arna? Okay, well, 
I guess two things. And and I hate to kind of bring this one up, to be honest with you, but um, I don't know how many years ago it was that somebody had run for election, was not elected, and then was named vice president. And I have to tell you, I felt like that was a slap in the face to the membership. You know, that somebody who wasn't elected by the board was now going to be named an officer, an even kind of higher position. Um, you know, in spite of the membership saying, no, we didn't really want you on the board. I just, I just thought that was a really terrible thing to, for the board to do. And um, there's no offense here to, any, to the people who are involved in this situation. Um, and I you know, really didn't want to mention it, but that's one of the things that prompted me to do this motion. Um, Cause I thought that was insulting to the membership. The other thing that, you know, as John mentions, like maybe we can't come up with the person. I think that only shows that we are an incredibly dysfunctional board, that we can't agree on a president, um, that we have to go outside of us to find one, just highlights dysfunction. And I would prefer to just sit there for as long as it takes for us to agree on one person to be our president out of our board than to go outside of it. Because we have got to learn how to compromise and, you know, and agree on something. It's, it's just like cowardice, I think, to say we can't agree, so we're just gonna reach outside the board. You know, why can't we agree? We're 12 adults and we should be able to come to agreement on something like this. And I, I think it's, you know, I guess I think it's kind of sad to say, you know, we can't put this in the, in the bylaws because we can't agree on a president. It, it makes me sad. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Erna. Kevin, you're next. Um, yeah, I agree. It feels like it sets a precedent for any folks, new folks, as someone new coming to the board, that you can expect that folks don't want to work together and that they expect that they probably won't work together. And that's not why we're here. It's not what the membership wants us to do. And so to be able to do that, you know, also again, negates the elections process. Why have the elections process if we can just all get together and pluck someone that we all want on to the board? But sometimes it kind of opens up to that kind of thing as well. Factions wise, you can get a certain amount of people that want some that want someone that was in the elections that didn't make it and they don't care. They'll just get them on there anyway. So I feel like it is kind of something that goes against what the membership wants as well as does not set a good precedent for working together, which is the goal for us to work together, to work for the fair, to work for the membership, to work for staff, for everyone out there and set the example of what the board should be. So um, yeah, I, um, I'm hoping to get some better stories than that one. So uh, thanks everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Next up is Sue. I want to bring up another viewpoint on this. The board is comprised of a lot of very dedicated, mostly busy. I'm just saying mostly because I don't know everybody's private life, but I would assume that most of us are fairly busy. There could come a time when we've got a great group of board members, but nobody feels that they have the time or the skill set to become the president or vice president, but most especially the president. I would not want to tie a future board's hand to force someone to become the president. That's just the thought that's been going on in my head for several days now. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Next up is AJ. Yeah, um, this is an interesting topic. Uh, and just to share a little bit, when I first became a board member, um, 
the first real traumatic experience was this vote for president and vice president by the board. Um, I was elected vice president with a caveat that I did not have enough experience in life or whatever. And it became a really big battle um, that um, a member who was not elected was vote had to be voted in as a co-vice president with me because I was being told I didn't have enough experience uh, to do it myself. And at that time, I was a 45, 44-year-old professional um, with lots of experience and being asked my resume and stuff. I say that all to say this, without having... Um, that the president or the vice president be a duly elected board member, um, it it can weaponize the process, and I've seen it happen firsthand. Um, and what it does is it, it, instead of forcing, which it should, because the membership votes for us all, is enforcing us to work together and figure it out, it opens the door for backstabbing it opens the door for another player to be involved. Um, and I've seen this happen in several, over the last two decades, uh, versions of this cause so much more conflict in that uh, election process that the board has of the vice president and president. Um, and so I, I completely disagree that the fact that we would leave it open would cause less drama somehow or less stress, I think what it does is it provides another avenue uh, for the board to get away from working together and trying to figure it out. Thanks, AJ. John Alexander? Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, I'll be brief. Sue, I do appreciate your point about how much work it is. And Tom, thanks for doing all that work um, this year for us. Uh, big time. Um, at the same time, I would don't think I'd be comfortable making the leader of our organization or of our board a non-elected person. So I just want to echo what Arna said about it's our first opportunity to collaborate as a board to um, either compromise or consents or whatever it needs to do to get our job done. So I think that's a real good point, Arna. And um, I'll leave it there. Thanks, John. Sandra? Yeah, I was, when I first found out that the um, the president and the vice presidents didn't need to be board members, I was really, you know, pretty surprised. I had never really heard of that before. So I know we looked it up and there's a quirk in Oregon law where it's legal. So, um, you know, that's what they did. But I don't know that it's the best policy by far. I think that... Um, uh, you know, I think somebody who's appointed that isn't elected isn't accountable in the same way. And I think that accountability is important. Um, and I I also think that, you know, we, we have to be, um, if we're, man we are mandated to have a president and a vice, at least one vice president. And sometimes you just have to sit there until uh, you know, and work out deals until you come to a solution. And I, the first year I was on the board, we did that at the retreat, and it took quite a while and a lot of toing and froing. But we did end up coming together with a uh, with a plan. The plan didn't actually stick, but still we got there. And I think if we had continued, we would have been able to to do it again. But I, I do think it's possible, and I think it's preferable. And um, um, uh, so anyway, I, I do hope that we pass this. I think it's, it's a good policy. And I, and I do think that the, that the person who's doing that kind of work, uh, either as a vice president or the president, should be accountable uh, to, the, um, to the organization. Um, and if somebody outside, I, I think somebody should... I, I actually, I've actually, actually thought that we should direct elect 
a president and a vice president. A lot of organizations do that. You run for the board and you run for the office. And um, if you don't, if you're not elected to the um, to the board, then you can't be elected to the office. But I like that. I think that's extremely, um, uh, you know, I think that is important. People, the board, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that the membership directly elect uh, those offices. I think that's, I think that would be, um, I, I'd like to see that, but I will vote for this. You know, I think this is good policy, so I'll be supporting it. Thanks, Sandra. Lisa? So, um... When Arna first uh, approached me um, to let me know that she was going to be bringing this forward, um, I didn't really have a strong stance on it at the time because um, I really wanted to think about um, what is the you know historical context of why um, our bylaws say that officers need not be elected board uh, members. And I think the reason for that, that is a very practical reason that makes a lot of sense, is that, for instance, the treasurer um, has a specific skill set that we need in that position. And if somebody is doing a good job, um, we don't want to have to replace them if we lose them because they're not elected to the board. And so having stability in a position such as treasurer or secretary, I think is really important. Um, as far as the president and vice president roles, I'm not quite as um you know, I I don't have a problem with this policy if this passes. I'm totally okay with it. I think it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, so again, I you know I think that that's probably the reason why it said that in the bylaws. Um, when I think about historical context, and um. I think it makes good sense to have the the president and vice presidents um, be duly elected board members. I do. I am hearing. I am hearing um, what some of my other board colleagues have expressed, um, and i i don't um, I don't disagree with those concerns either. Um, but overall, I don't have a problem with this. Thanks, Lisa. Arna? Um, so I'm really glad to hear this discussion. I had said we did hear from the membership, a couple of people in the membership who would like to table this for a month. And I had said that, that I would be agreeable to that. I, and I still am. And I would like to, I think, table this for a month for the membership. Um, so they've heard our discussion, they can think about it now, and they can tell us their opinions, if they have any. I do see Paxton and Anne have their hands up, um, so maybe we could table it after they speak, if they still want to speak, um, and then table it till next month and put it on for old business for next month, so that the membership has a little more time to digest this. Kevin, are you amenable to that? Yeah, totally. No, like I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, excited about the conversation. I think uh, I agree with Lisa. There's a lot that we've heard from other colleagues. It's, um, again, this is what I want to hear. So, no, let's do that. It's fine. Sounds good. Paxson, we'll close out with you. If you have any final comments you'd like to mention now, and we'll table this. Uh, I'm happy to table this. I do want to say that, that we are all here working for the best for the fair. Uh, I really dislike the discussion about uh, about how divided we are. We may be, but we're all here trying to do the very best for the fair. Thank you. Thanks, Paxton. 
Um, you got Anne on there too, Al. Sure. Anne? Um, I agree with Paxton that we're working for the best. I just have some feelings of unforeseen consequences, both in the short term and long term at some practical level. And um, I'm okay with tabling it, but I've just always felt that there's something unforeseen that I haven't been able to clarify yet in my mind. Thank you. All right, and Kirsten, you have a comment here? Uh, not about this tabling, but I would encourage the board to move the logo items ahead of the progressive solutions policy, as that is an extremely timely uh, vote that needs to happen tonight. Not that I don't want to get to progressive solutions, because I think we'll get to it, but I would encourage the board to rearrange and take on the logo items next, if anybody has uh, an opinion on that. Thank you. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Is there any dissent to this? Oh, there's a lot more thumbs up. Okay, I'm happy to move that to the next spot here. So let's talk about the logo items with Sue and Arna. Um, just a little by way of explanation. Um, I'm hoping that everybody got the email that was sent out uh, from me via craft, in, well, from craft inventory via me um, with all the uh, images of this year's applicants. Um, again, we are not we are not voting on oh the quality of the craft item. It is the use of the logo. The other part of the motion will be approving the previously accepted logo items that have not reached the five year acceptance level. Once you've had your logo item for five years, then it doesn't have to be voted on again. You are automatically uh, accepted to do that for as long as you want. So without further ado, Arno, with your permission, I'd like to make the motion. Go ahead. Okay. Move to approve the new 2023 logo items and approve the previously accepted logo items that have not yet met the five year approval mark. I second. Thank you, Thank Arna. You. I'll open this up for membership comments first. And I'll move it to board discussion. Lisa. I just want to thank Sue for sending out um, the photos of the new um, submissions. I did take a look at them and I liked every single thing that I saw. And um, I would say yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Lisa. John Silverman. There we go. So item number five on the on the new logo. I mean, are these shirts that are going to be supplied by the people doing the silk screening? Or are these shirts that people will bring to them to be silk screened? I'm not clear on that. Uh, Adam. Adam. Oh, sorry. Clarification. Please. Yeah, so, so number five is a crafter who is approved for the sort of service craft of um, running a, a, a do your own tie dye. So they facilitate um, participants and guests at the fair um, dyeing their own um, shirts. The garments will be available, the blank white garments would be available at the booth for purchase as the as garments are now um, in this case they would just have a logo screen printed on them the crafter is not um and a the craft for which the crafter is approved is not screen printing um but 
uh, that's not the craft they're selling still. It's the craft is the um, is the tie dyeing. So that's their uh, perspective on providing these shirts as blanks essentially for their craft. I guess what, if I may, a follow up. Yeah. Um, the examples there, some of them look an awful lot like staff t shirts. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, my and, concern. Yeah, it's sure. Fun. And we, and we're aware, um, we generally don't even allow something to come through that that is uh, just a staff T-shirt sort of logo um, because there has been issues with that, that in the past, and we uh, recommend that folks who are submitting logo logo T-shirts um, do something different. Um, in this case, the reason we put it through for review was because these shirts, because they are going to be, um, because the craft is the do-it-yourself tie-dye, when they leave the booth with the craft, it's wrapped up um, and set uh, while the dye is setting. So the, the, um, the craft itself goes home with the person it needs to set for 24 hours and then you wash it out. So it's not a, sh it's not that you won't leave the booth with a fully formed shirt that you could wear at the event. After 24 hours, you could, couldn't you? After you, you could take it back to your tent and, and rinse it out and wear. Or if you have a three-day pass, you take it home and come back the next day wearing that shirt. I suppose you could. Um, so that's and, my concern. I, 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 I'm prepared to vote for everything else, but I'm not prepared to vote for this particular item because I have that concern. I mean, if, 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 if you're, yeah, so it, it looks too much like a staff t-shirt and someone yeah. could come back um, wearing it. Thanks, John. And thanks for the clarification, Adam. Uh, Spirit, you have a clarifying question here. Yeah, I wouldn't pipe in if it wasn't important to the security issues that John is raising, which I totally understand. Uh, on the other hand, we do do extensive training with our crews that we are not just anybody can come through with a t-shirt on. We are checking credentials, whether wristband or laminate front and back. And so I just wanted to uh, reassure the board that a tie dyed shirt with a uh, Oregon Country Fair logo is not going to get you past uh, checkpoints. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. I do feel like it's pertinent to this discussion. I do appreciate it being in there. Um, Sandra? Yeah, um, I also, I, I was looking at that shirt too, but it's tie-dye. None of our staff shirts are tie-dye. You know, it's tie-dyed on a white shirt. So I think that that would really stand out. But I, I did like all of the items. I thought they were interesting and I'm going to, you know, I hope there's a map that shows where all these tie dyed things are. So <laughs> they're easy well, to Sue, find. Sue, Sue does that. She puts a book together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, thank you for your selections. Uh, they were, you know, it's always fun to see these. It's a, it's a highlight. So thank you. Thanks, John. Well, my, my concern about it looking like a staff t-shirt wasn't that they would sneak in saying they were staff. It's that they might represent themselves to another member of the public who is not as knowledgeable about the fair and represent themselves as staff. Um, and uh, maybe the possibility of that happening is low, but I think it's a possibility and to make that possibility zero, I just don't think we should be having t-shirts printed that look like staff t-shirts, even if they're silk screened, because this still looks like a staff t-shirt and could very well look like a staff t-shirt to, to somebody who's not um, as familiar with the fair. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I when I first saw those shirts, I had the same exact um, thought as John. It wasn't that I thought that they would be able to get through security because I, I know better than that, but that um, another fairgoer might um, might not know um, the difference. Um, but then I read that the folks that would be purchasing these shirts and doing their own tie dye would not um, be able to wear it right away. They would be leaving with the packaged product. 
so it wouldn't be worn on site. And then I also remembered, you know, in the past when we discussed uh, the same issue as a board about making sure that um, t-shirts don't look, don't resemble staff shirts too closely, it was brought to my attention that, you know, people find fair shirts at goodwill. I mean, people can get fair shirts um, without uh, having been on staff. I guess the only thing that makes a little bit of a difference to me is that these ones have the current year on them, the current year logo. So that that makes me a little bit more nervous about that, about that possibility. Um, but it it does seem it does seem rather remote. So that's where I came to the conclusion that I could um, approve those. Thanks, Lisa. Arna? Well, I could approve these as they are, but I was wondering, Adam, if these shirts could be accepted without the year on them, could we tell the artist, are they, are there blanks? I mean, they haven't, if they haven't been accepted yet, I'm assuming they haven't done a ton of them. Um, and could we say to them, we will accept them without the year? So uh, last year, uh, there's precedent for this. Last year, um, something was approved pending um, proof provided by the crafter that they had rights to use. I think it was a um, steal your face logo. So I, I don't, I, there is precedent for the board saying uh, approved um, with this change. Uh, if you wanted to make an amendment to the uh, motion, that would probably fly. And yeah, and I would I would make the assumption that they haven't done a whole lot of these yet since they haven't been approved because I wouldn't want them to be losing a lot of money, you know. Yeah. I, I don't have any information on that, but likely. Thanks. Right. Uh, appreciate it, John. Yeah, and and to follow up on that, I mean, if they want to put the year on the back, they want to put the year on the sleeve, but putting the year exactly where it is on all the staff T-shirts makes it look like a staff t-shirt to me so you know if, if the year is important put it on the back or something um but I, I would vote for it if we make that distinction that the the year either not have the year on it or the year be in a different location than uh where it is on staff t-shirts i'm hearing a passable amendment uh you made the motion sue would you consider Yes. Yes. Um, can we do this in two? We'll approve everything but number five and then have a separate motion for number five asking them to uh, put the year elsewhere. Does that work? That makes sense. Okay. Then I, um, I will accept the amendment to remove logo item number five for approval at this point. Uh, I'll accept that too. Okay. Let's take the first motion, everything except for item number five for approval. I will collect votes starting with Anne. Yes. Paxton? Yes. John Alexander? Yes. Tom? Yes. Sue? Yes. Arna? Yes. Lisa? Yes. George? Yes. AJ? Yes. John Silverman? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Okay, that is approved. Now, Sue. I would like to make the second motion now. Mm -hmm. Instruct craft inventory to inform the maker of logo item number five that it cannot be approved unless the year is moved to another spot on the shirt. Um, uh, no. Sue, or, or, removed. or removed. Or removed. Moved or removed. From the shirt. But is there... does that, excuse me, just a second. 
It, does that motion say that they are, what, maybe the motion should say they are approved if the year is moved to another spot, place or um, removed? Ryan, saying, do you want to make the motion? I'm happy with that if you want to make a motion. Okay, I just was, you say they can't be approved until unless they are, but, but we are saying they are approved if that happens, right? I agree. Yes. Okay, I move that um, shirts number five will be are approved, assuming that the year is moved to a different location on the shirt or removed completely. We're asking craft inventory to inform the artist. Craft, of that. Right, asking craft inventory um, to tell the office that the shirts are approved if the date is moved to a different place on the shirt or removed completely. Can second. Arna, can you type it into the chat? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it was, sorry, but it will be very helpful for no, no, the vote and for our wonderful note taker uh, to get it clear. Yeah, I get it. No, it's fine. I'm going to mute myself as I mutter. My <laughs> no worries. I appreciate it. I've taken a lot of meeting minutes in the past as well, so it's very good to get this written down. If I'm getting this wrong, people tell me, okay? I'm uh, sure they will. So great, Arda. <laughs> <laughs> Just to fill space. It's so fun to vote on something so beautiful. This is so great. <laughs> it's usually just text. And I, I, I want to inform everybody that the, the craft submission deadline was Saturday. And for craft inventory to be able to get us those photos yesterday evening was quite the feat. And I really, I really want to give a shout out to Adam Bud because I'm sure he was the one who directed all of that. And it's very much appreciated. I really didn't think we'd get to see them until about three o'clock this afternoon. So having a day to look at them was wonderful. Thank you, Adam. Yes, thank you, Adam. Yeah. Is that correct for the motion, guys? Sue, does that look right to you? I'm not. I don't see it. Oh, shoot. Of course, I didn't click the arrow to send it. Here you go. <laughs> Here we go. Arna moves the craft inventory inform the maker of item number five that the t shirts are accepted if the date is moved to another area of the t shirt or removed completely. That works? Second. That works. I'll yeah. second that. I feel like we've already had a long and wonderful conversation on the topic. So we'll move uh, to votes on this. I will start with Paxton. Yes. Arna? Yes. Anne? Yes. Oh, thank you. Sandra? Yes. AJ? Yes. Lisa? Yes. George? Yes. John Silverman? Yes. Kevin? Yes. John Alexander? Yes. Sue? Yes. And Tom? Yes. That is approved. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Adam, for being here. The last item here on our old business is Fair Care Progressive Solutions Policy with AJ and Kevin. May I give a quick little um, introduction? Please. Um, we have invited Robbie, uh, actually the, the entire team um, that put this policy together to the meeting tonight. Robbie and um, Lily will be presenting the policy and answering questions. 
So I will leave it to AJ and or uh, Kevin to make the motion. And then we give the floor to Robbie and Lily uh, to, to give a presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Kevin. I'll leave it to you, Kevin. Okay, sure. Uh, I So um, I think we have written on here. I move uh, to approve the uh, Fair Care Progressive Solutions Policy. Thanks, Kevin. And AJ? I second that. Wonderful. Uh, Robbie, do you are, yeah. Vanessa, can you make Robbie a co-host? I do not seem to have that power. Either we have too many co-hosts or I need you to be able to do it. I tried to give Robbie there she goes. She got it. Thank you. Never mind. Yeah, I already had it. Thank you. Okay. Are you guys seeing the correct screen? Okay, great. We see your PowerPoint, Robbie. Okay, thank you. Okay. All righty. So I am Robbie and I'm representing Fair Care tonight with Lily presenting the Progressive Solutions Policy. Um, so in 2019, uh, Fair Care was put together um, as an operational work group. Our calling is creating policy and procedure for the fair around people and relationships. Our first task was revising the grievance procedures, which hadn't been revised for 10 plus years. In 2021, the update was passed by the board. And in fall of 2022, the board passed a motion directing fair care to work on a new policy with, quote, progressive and measured responses when code of, uh, when code of conduct violations occur. Fair Care is coming to you today with a policy rather than a procedure, which has been vetted by our legal team and incorporating feedback we received from individuals involved in recent grievances, new expertise, and several engagement sessions with the board, the membership, and the management team. I won't read this whole slide as it has been posted on the .NET site for review, but I did want to highlight how we envision requests for support. Yes? I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're still on the screen. We still see that first slide. Can you advance for us? We didn't you, even get to see the second slide, but you did a lovely job summarizing I, it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Is it, what do you see now? Do you see? Progressive solutions process summary. Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting your flow. Oh. It's not in presentation mode, so. Okay. Well, then it's just on the wrong side. That's okay. Well, this is the second slide just for, for giggles. Just enjoy, you guys. Thanks, Robbie. Okay, there we go. All right, so here we go. All right, um, I did want to highlight how we envision requests for support routing through the process. The way the policy is written, we will have the flexibility that we critically need to be able to address the many, many different kinds of conflicts that arise at FAIR. We learned assigning one single type of mediative modality to every situation was unnecessarily time consuming and could create additional harm rather than resolving it. So what are some of the really big changes that you're expected to see? Our focus is changing from process focused to a very people focused policy. This policy will allow us to continue providing resources and support until that conflict is resolved. The grievance procedure ended with arbitration, as an example. Um, so if a conflict between those same two people continued after arbitration was finished, a whole new grievance was required. With this policy, we'll reduce that inefficiency and additional harm caused and move on to the next step in the progressive solutions policy. The policy is also faster. For example, arbitration, very time consuming. Restorative justice, also very time consuming. So if passed, what would happen next? We have a lot of recruiting to do. We'll be updating the definitions to correlate with the new policy. We'll also create trainings, 
and communications. After we're finished with implementation of Progressive Solutions Policy, we hope to move on finally to other policies, including um, code of conduct, which we're very excited to tackle. Okay. And lastly, I wanna say a brief thank you to my colleagues in Fair Care. It couldn't have been done without you. And to the membership, to the board and management, Fair Care thanks you for your time, collaboration and consideration. So I'll stop sharing for now and open for questions. Thanks. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. We will uh, first open for member comments. I see no member commentary here. So I'll open it up to the board. This is really how you know you did a good and thorough job. <laughs> there we go. Uh, John Silverman. Well, I'll be first again. Um, I voted against the motion that referred this whole thing to fair care in the first place um, because I thought this was not the correct approach. Um, and I still think it's not the correct approach. Um, I think this is an incomplete policy at best if there's mediation and and uh, restorative justice is can happen as part of step one, that needs to be in the policy explicitly. It's not. Um, if it's not in there, uh, you know, it, it's just going to cause problems. So if that was the intent, that really does need to be in there. Um, I think the process that's lined out um, doesn't take. Um, it pretty much makes the investigators and, and, and the fact finders and the decision makers. Um, uh, 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 I don't see much independence there. Yes, arbitration takes time, but there's an element of independence there um, uh, whereby, um, uh, you know, the, the, the parties select the people who are going to ultimately make the decision. Um, I think this policy is philosophically, it's, it's, it's uh, punitive and coercive um, and not, I don't think it reflects the values that I think the fair wants to um, reflect um, that the values that were in that restorative justice um, uh, version of the grievance procedures. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna be able to vote for this tonight uh, the way it's written. Um, I had debated whether to um, uh, move to table it and have asked for more work on it or just to vote against it. And I'm, I'm more inclined to vote against it. I, I just can't support it. I think it would be better to look at previous grievance policy, restorative justice, and elements of this one and combine them and come up with a comprehensive approach. And to simply say, oh, we're gonna pass this tonight and then we're gonna address these other things later. Um, I, I don't think that's appropriate. I'd rather see everything all in one policy in one motion. Um, and I would much rather see uh, and the other thing that I don't see in this is um, any consideration for any of the issues raised by the DEI consultants about how um, diversity related uh, grievances ought to be handled. Um, uh, and in particular, one thing that struck me was that the support person that uh, somebody's being accused of something, the support person they can have can't speak on behalf of the person. I just find that 
real strange that you can't have somebody speak on your behalf. Um, and uh, so I, I just can't support this policy as it is. And I'll be voting no. Thanks, John. Kevin? Well, Robbie, uh, just for Robbie and for all fair cares, uh, speaking to what uh, John's saying as far as, you know, modification, things like that, uh, what does that look like? Um, is there, I imagine this is a somewhat living document process kind of thing where it's going to be changing and evolving as you have these different experiences, or is it just kind of, this is it and that's it kind of thing? I'm just curious about that. Well, Speaking of, you know, what Tom was saying. Thanks. Robbie. Okay, okay. Um, well, as always, we have, you know, we will gather our feedback that we especially um, listen to the feedback from the people that were in, that have been in recent grievances. And we base a lot of these changes um, on those experiences and we will continue to do that we will continue to gather that feedback um, and come back if it doesn't work of course um, so i think oh lily would you like to take the rest of the response please yeah so um for the process of getting the grievance process approved by the board in fall of 2021, the Fair Care Work Group made the commitment to the board that we would revise and submit for approval a revised process policy within one year of enacting the policy. And I think that Fair Care is making that commitment to the board again right now for this one. For the former grievance process, we actually began the review process within two months. And by six months, we knew that it needed a complete revision and rewrite. Um, so in in six months, we might know the same thing. I think, Kevin, to address your concerns, we it's not really a living document. It's a policy which must be approved by the board. It can't change without approval by the board. But what this and this speaks to what John said, this is a policy, not a procedure. This is a policy approved by the board, and it gives the power or the the weight of responsibility of enacting this policy with appropriate procedures for conflict resolution, mediation, and support to the executive director or a management desig a designee of management. Um, so that's the reason it's appropriate for the policy to not indicate stepwise whether mediation or restorative justice or a specific modality of conflict resolution is, is outlined in the policy. Those are procedure-oriented questions. That's the operationalization Sorry, that's a lot of syllables for my tongue. Operationalization of this policy, that's up to the people who are enacting the policy into procedure. And, and we've discussed that both as a work group. I've just, we've discussed that with the management team. We've worked with different staff members. We've worked with conflict resolution um, professionals in the community. We've looked at what other institutions similar to ours have. We've we've worked with HR professionals. And so we have a really good understanding of what the operation operations will look like when this policy becomes procedure. That's just not necessarily written into a policy. That does give it a little flexibility. Maybe, Kevin, that's the flexibility that you want to see in a living document. As long as we're within the confines of what the policy guarantees as rights and privileges to fair community members, that we will address concerns and offer support to you when you're in the midst of a conflict. Um, the, the way that looks is different and every conflict is different and every person involved in a conflict and who's requesting support is different and has different needs. And that can speak both to the needs for a trauma informed process like this. This is flexible enough to if someone says I need to be involved, this feels like a diversity issue to me or I have had trauma in the past and I'd like you to take it into account my trauma in this process. This policy offers enough flexibility to the restorative justice or mediation or counseling professionals to do just that. It also, um, I think John is the one who said it and I wanted, maybe it was Kevin. This is the whole, the whole policy. There's not future pieces that are later to be approved. Some of the work as, as Robbie discussed in the slideshow, we do have next steps but it won't be coming back to the board for approval of those next steps as a, that is the operational aspect of what the policy becomes. So this is the policy until we review it. 
this is the policy that we're proposing until it comes back to the board for review after we've done some data collection and analysis and find out that there's holes, things that we didn't foresee happening, things that um, maybe are a little chunky. Maybe we need to expand the conflict resolution options that we have at the fair in addition to the mediation crew and what CEDAR offers and outside professionals we can bring in. So I think we'll learn that in the coming months after we have a few people who've come through the process, much as we did with the grievance process that was passed in 2021. Thanks, Sully. Uh, Martha, did you want to add any more to this? Nope, thank you. Lily said it very well. Thank you. I, I agree. Um, Kevin, did you have anything else or was that covered? Uh, no, I thought that was awesome. I Yeah, it feels kind of like, it's like, I agree with John, you know, there's going to be just so many moving parts, but I also feel that getting this thing rolling is kind of uh, a way to kind of figure out what that looks like as we're, as they're doing it. And so I like that I can hear that I hear there's flexibility there and it's not just this, that's it. So um, yeah, no, thank you, Lily. I uh, really appreciate it. You too, Robert. Thank you. Paxton? You're muted. Sorry. Uh, how many grievance cases have we had in recent times? How many do you expect to, would be dealing with under this policy per year? Any guesses? If we do it right, we will see more. We want to see more. We want to help more people. We've I'm trying to get a, a rough number of how yes. much we've done and what is expected. We have seen, we saw a little under 10 last year. Okay. Um, there were essentially three different situations happening, 10 different grievances, and we would hope to see more. Um, I, I would like to see this go to a board working session. Uh, for more questions. I have several questions on this. Uh, uh, I, I think it's very, very complicated for a limited number of cases. Uh, I also don't think that both sides uh, in these disputes are represented well, or at least I would like some more, I have more questions about that. And I have several other things that I've written down on, on, the, uh, uh, on my copy of it that I'd like to get some more questions for. So I would love to see it go to a board working session. Thank you. Thanks, Paxton. Uh, Sandra. Yeah, I wanted to thank you guys for the years of work that you put into this policy and uh, all the input that you've had from so many interested parties. And, uh, you know, you've done You've done a, a heavy lift here. Right now, we do not have a working grievance policy. It's broken. We have nothing that we have no way of dealing with interpersonal conflict, and we badly need it. And the idea of going into the fair without any way to manage uh, conflict or um, crises, to me, is um, is you know. Uh, I don't think we would be doing our jobs not to get not to have the tools that we need available to, you know, to um, take down the the heat that there is sometimes out there. I think it's really important. And um, you know, uh, in a in a policy, you don't have. I I, I agree that having it too prescriptive it really um, shackles you in, in how to deal with stuff. And I, I think that that's been a real problem. Um, I think that that um, there's a lot of skilled people who've had input on this. This has been reviewed by the attorneys. Um, and I, you know, it's gotten great feedback there. I would like to see it passed. Um, I think these things to, I think you learn a lot when you start implementing just like, I mean, having something not work gives you just as much information as having something work, you know, because then you know what you have to fix. 
and you fix it. That's how we do all of these things. We give it our best shot. We think it through as well as we can. We figure it out. Then we put it into action. And then you find out, well, you know, we sure could have done that part a little bit better, you know, and you fix it. And so I, you know, I just can't, I just think it would be, you know, poor service on our part not to have some kind of process going into the fair um, that we could use to, um, you know, uh, you know, work on some some of the conflict that we have. I, I really hope that there's support for this and that we pass it. Thanks, Sandra. Arna? Um, well, thank you guys for working on this policy. I think it's great. Um, it, it's a lot of smart people worked on this thing, I can tell. Um, our current grievance process is broken and has been for quite a while. Um, and people don't file grievances because they're like, why bother? You know, the process doesn't work, you know, so I'm not even going to get involved in it. Um, so I think we do really need a new process. And I like a lot of things about this one. I like the flexibility in it, um, that you're not trapped into one set way of going if you, you know, you know, get involved in this process. And I think that's important because as you say, people are all different. You know, what's the events are all different and the issues are all different. And having just one set hard, fast way that you have to go does just doesn't work for everybody. So I like that you've built this flexibility into it. And I like that you have clear consequences. You know, there's a warning, there's a warning letter. I mean, it's all very clear what is going to happen. And I think that is really important and that there are consequences, I think is important. Um, you know, and I don't mind that there's not a lot of detail in here because um, as Sandra said, details are operational. This is a policy, you know, and it has to be broad. And if you put a lot of detail in here, then anytime you wanna change something, you have to come to the board to change it. And that slows everything down and that's just doesn't work. And you are gonna make changes, you know, because nobody ever writes the perfect thing the first time out, not even really smart people. You know, you have to see, put something in, in action, you know, and see how it works and then tweak it, you know, and sometimes you have to make really big tweaks. And I'm really glad that you guys are open to seeing that and making revisions to it as you may need to, you know, because that's really important, you know, to not go in and saying, well, we got the perfect thing, you know, and we're never going to change it. You know that things are going to change. So I'm, I'm really happy with um, how this is. And you definitely got my vote on it. Um, I'm impressed. Thank you. Thanks, Arna. AJ? Yeah, I'll just try to be brief here. Um, I just want to uh, appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Um, you know, I I can't thank you guys enough for the effort and the, um, the amount of people that you've had involved in this process to try to get something um, for this organization that works. Um, so I appreciate that and thank you for that. And the only other thing I would say to that is, I think a community without accountability is doomed to fail. And what I see in this policy is an attempt for us as an organization to say that there has to be some sort of accountability and it could be good accountability. It, accountability works both ways, positive and negative, for one's actions. Um, and I don't want this community to fail. So we we have to figure out a way that we can agree on some method of holding each other accountable for how we treat each other. And I think this policy is trying to do that. And I appreciate the effort. Thanks, AJ. John Alexander. Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, again, I, I, I echo uh, how the, the, the thank you to this group 
And um, when I came into the board, one of the things that I was thinking about is that we were having troubles with the, the personal end of conflict and it needed to be fixed and it was taking too long. And it was getting in the way maybe of us solving some of the organizational conflict we have. And so having a streamlined process um, is going to allow us to take the personal conflict and have it handled and not get in the way with some of the other things that we're doing um, that we're, we're dealing with as an organizational and organizational conflict. So I think that that's really important too. I feel very informed. I did sit in on the sessions. You all did a fantastic job um, listening to questions, addressing questions, and all of those other kind of things that you did through the process and the work sessions. I'd be concerned, Paxton. I really understand where you're coming from, and I don't want to discount it, but we don't have any work sessions left between now and the fair, and we need something in place now. And I feel like it's gone through a lot, and we've had a lot of chances to look at it and review it. And I hope what Kevin mentioned and the answer to that is, yes, this is a policy, and for it to be changed, we need to change policies, but there's flexibility for it to be a working process within this policy. So I think it's really important we get something in place, and we get something in place now. Um, so thank you, uh, Fair Care. I feel very fairly cared for. Thanks, John. And first, first of all, um, I'd, I'd like to especially thank Lily and Robbie because I've heard you at some of the um, group um, presentations and you speak really clearly of that. But sometimes I feel what you speak is not included in this document and, you know, when I read the summary that was sent to me, the first sentence being people who work together often encounter conflict. And that word often made it sound like there was constant conflict. And, you know, that I know that that isn't true, or I don't believe it's true, and it's not what I see. So, you know, it, it made me really skeptical about it. I found the definitions very inclusive. That's, but when I read the policy in general, I can't, if I didn't know what I already know about the fair, I would not know where those, some of those definitions fit in because the individual or group involved is not clearly identified in that policy, whether they are part of the, overarching umbrella or part of um, the policy itself. And I do have a concern as um, I think it was um, John mentioned about DEI grievances and especially if the support person is, it's just there can't, can't provide, can't clarify if there's a language problem or some other problem. Um, to the people involved. And yeah, I can see having a board work session and, um, you know, but um, I think what my real problem was in the first sentence of the summary, which was, you know, where I read often encounter conflict and have worked in really, and I prefer personally have worked in really hostile environments and, um, never considered it often encounter conflict. And um, so, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Lisa. Um, I want to thank the Fair Care Work Group um, very, very much for all of the heart and soul that you have put into this document. Um, I do agree that the current grievance process that we do have in place um, has some gaps. Um, I think that's pretty clear that there are some gaps there. But when I um, read over this document and I've, I've poured over it um, quite a bit in the last um, week or so, um, there are, a lot of things missing that um, that concern me. I am very familiar with how policy and procedure um, interconnect, and um, 
So, you know, some of the things that I see missing, I do not see any um, language to ensure any participants that they will receive fair and equitable treatment. I do not see any reference to restorative justice. Um, and I do not see any parameters for when a situation may not be appropriate for a particular step, when it's appropriate to skip or combine steps. And um, that isn't just something that I, I feel okay about, you know, saying, oh, well, that's just all operational, you know, hands off. You know, I think that those are important pieces that need to be included in the policy. Um, at this point, you know, I, I think that, yes, the current grievance policy um, that we have does have some gaps, but this has a lot of gaps as well. And I don't feel uh, any rush to replace something with gaps with some, something with gaps. Um, that doesn't make good sense to me. I would have preferred that we had a board working assembly on this prior to it coming before the board. I did attend the meeting that the Fair Care Work Group had with board members back in November. I did express my concerns about the direction that this was going back then as well. Um, so, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm, you know, I see this policy as, um, it's essentially a progressive discipline policy that you might find in any corporate environment. And I don't think that this really represents who we are as an organization. I'm not prepared to vote yes on this tonight. I, I, would, um, I would be um, interested in um, seeing it uh, you know, seeing more work be done, having a board work session. Um, I don't feel a sense of urgency uh, to put this into place just because the fair is coming up. We put the grievance process on hold for the fair anyway. So it doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't see that it's, it's urgent that we um, adopt this prior to the fair at this point. I think we have time and I would rather take the time um, to get something um, that feels uh, more solid, that feels like a bigger improvement over what we have, um, that feels representative of who we are, um, and that feels uh, as though, you know, if if I were a participant in um, in this process that I would be confident that I would receive fair and equitable treatment. Um, and I don't see any of that in this. So that's it. Thanks, Lisa. Mars, am I correct that you helped work on this document? And I only wanted to respond particularly to Anne because those were my words often in counter conflict. Um, you have a particular perspective on the fair. And we talk a lot about being fair family and about the love. And so there's some sense that membership and individuals feel bad. Oh, it must be my fault that things aren't working. It, you know, and it was not at all to imply constant conflict, but to reassure people if they've come to a loggerheads with somebody or with a the situation, there's a way to resolve that. They don't have to say, oh, I guess I'm not going to be part of this again. But thank you for that feedback. Let me, that's the particular piece I wanted to respond to. Thank you, Martha. Lily? Yeah, I have a few points I'd like to make. Um, the first is that a few, a few folks have mentioned that there is not restorative justice referred to directly in this document. The last iteration of the grievance process relied heavily on restorative justice. We had a, like a, I don't know if he was world renowned, but he seemed like he was world renowned, restorative justice practitioner on our work group. 
He guided us through creating a restorative justice model that we believed was gonna carry the, the grievance process forward. And then we found through working with him, working with the grievances that were filed through further research into literature and the field that the restorative justice model doesn't actually fit very many of these interpersonal conflicts. And um, we, we, I might go so far as to say we found that it was causing further harm to people involved. I, I believe in restorative justice. We've seen incredible models of it working to resolve conflicts and to support community healing around the world. I'd love for some conflicts or for anyone who believes it's the right model for them to have the opportunity to use it. But given that it's not the modality we believe after our review of what's happened at the fair in the recent years and our literature review from around the industry, I, I don't believe it's going to be chosen by people in conflict enough as the correct modality for them that it's that it should be referenced directly in this policy. It can absolutely still be used. We still have relationships with restorative justice practitioners in the Eugene area who have committed to being a resource for us. But it's because I, we as a work group are not clear that it's going to be used frequently, it's, it's inappropriate to include it in this policy more than just saying different modalities of conflict resolution. I think that, um, there might be more work to do and we can do more work after passing tonight's after you folks pass tonight's policy but we do need to have something in place before the fair we need to have something in place soon because as someone said tonight like the process that we do have was causing more harm to others i don't want this organization to get stuck in a loop of letting perfect be the enemy of good we should get something that's great we should always be working to strive for the best quality of work and high level policies, but to leave a policy in place that we know is not working, that we know is causing further harm to people who are admired in conflict, people who have um, been traumatized by conflicts they've experienced within our organization and giving us their volunteer time is not a good enough reason because this policy might need to be improved. It's not a good enough reason to leave an old broken policy in place that could cause further harm just because this one's not perfect. We can perfect this after we see how it's it works, but we can't work through it without knowing how it works. And we have to get people to go through that process with us. That's part of the scientific method. It's part of process improvement. We've ha we have a quality improvement process built into this. We as a work group have committed to that. And so I do think that allowing this to pass, to be enacted for the fair care work group and for the support administrators and for the management team to get out there and offer this kinds of new kinds of support to our community is really appropriate. I think that through that we'll figure out when people need to have processes combined and combined steps or skipping steps based on what those specific conflicts are. But as we all know, think of the conflicts you've had in your lives over the past three years. There's things that are gonna happen that we could never have predicted. And having flexibility in that policy is the best way we can treat everyone with the, with ha handle these conflicts with the most care. And just to, uh, Lisa, I think that including language on fair and equitable treatment is a great idea. Um, for future drafts, but I do also want to point out that in our, I can't remember exactly which document it is, our mission statement, our bylaws, or our code of conduct, we are all granted the rights that, that we are a community of equals. And I think that insurance that people will be treated fair and equitably is built into our founding documents. So I feel comfortable asking for a policy to be passed that doesn't have that language because I think it's there in our institutional documents. Um, but we can certainly add that language for future drafts. Thanks, Lily. Sue? I really appreciate all the obvious heart and time and effort that has gone into this and all the thought. I have a lot of concerns about it as it stands and virtually all of those have been addressed, especially by Lisa. And we haven't talked about this at all. So I'm glad that someone else is thinking along the same lines I am. As much as I appreciate the work that's been done, I think it needs a little more work. Um, at this point, the way it's written, I am not ready to support it. And I do apologize for that to all the people who have worked so hard, but I'm not looking for perfect, but I'm looking for something a little better. Thank you. Thanks, Sue.
accent? Um, and AJ on there too. Um, oh, sorry, Pax, and uh, AJ's before you. I missed his hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, I appreciate your comments, Lily. Um, I think it's important for this whole board and everybody paying attention to recognize that the procedure, the policy that we have in place right now has caused so much harm and created more conflict within our organization over the past two and a half years that I've been on this board of directors um and it saddens me to think that we're going to go into uh, a fair with the same thing um because we don't have a, a perfect alternative um it does a disservice to those folks who are trying to do what the board says it wants us to do and says it wants to do itself is to reduce conflict and come together. Um, here we have a whole group of folks, not just the fair care group, but all of the stakeholders that have been involved in trying to help make this happen for months and months and months. Um, I would I would actually say more more than a year now that I that I can remember of collecting information and people having conversations. Uh, to try to come up with this that we have uh, in front of us tonight. Um, so I'm just, I'm just disappointed to hear um, that we might possibly go into uh, without an alternative to the mess that it's been over the last couple of years. Um, I, you know, I, I apologize to those people that have been waiting, those members that have been waiting for uh for this um and i'm i'm saddened that uh we can't help you right now thanks aj paxton i've gone through four rewrites of the grievance policies since the 1990s uh uh I'm not sure this is the best uh, in reality. I definitely agree the one we we're currently using is not working. Uh, I don't view this as a streamlined process. Maybe I can be sold on it, but I'd like to more explanation. Uh, I, uh, I, I just don't view this as, as a streamlined process. I really uh, uh, respect the people that worked on it. I think it was really good progress. I think we need to continue doing this. I don't think that uh, this is a final document, in my opinion. Uh, uh, and one of the things I long, learned long ago uh, at the fair, uh, and despite it says that we are a group of equals, the problem is more that we are treated equitably not we are not equal in reality uh that we need to be treated equitably throughout the organization uh uh and i'm not sure this does it thank you thanks paxton we are getting close to the end of time for this meeting uh i'll finish off the hands here arna You know, we had a board session with the Fair Cares group. They talked to the bums. They talked to the, they had an open session with the membership. We've had plenty of time to call them and ask them questions. Robbie sent us an email earlier last week saying, hey, can I answer any questions for you? You got any things you want to say? You know, they, they've given us a lot of time. We've had the policy. You know, we really could have reached out to Fair Cares and voiced our concerns to them before our meeting tonight. Um, they've been very responsive. And I'm sorry that the board members who aren't happy with this policy didn't take that time and do that. Um, 
I think most of us agree that the current grievance process is not working well or working at all. And I think Lily's point of um, what's that saying, um, let's not let the um, um, perf perfection be the enemy of the good or whatever that saying is. I mean, I think that's really where we're at here. Maybe this policy isn't perfect. I mean, most policies aren't, but we're working with a policy now that's really not good. And I think this policy is much better. And why should we stick our membership with a, a, a failed policy that we know is not working? Instead of trying this policy that has so much more promise for us and for the membership. So I guess I'd really encourage you, everyone to vote yes on this. And let's try moving forward. If this policy doesn't work, we're certainly no worse off than we are now with the policy that we have. And we could be a lot better off. And if this policy isn't working right, the Fair Cares group has said they will revise it. You know, no problem. They will come back and look at this. So that's it. I, I, I would like to see this policy get passed and I hope we do pass it tonight. Thanks, Arna. We'll end with you, John. Yeah, I'm trying to count votes and see whether it's going to pass or not. There's a lot of smart people, and I appreciate that. All those folks have put work into it, and I appreciate uh, what folks are saying who are not fully in support of this right now. And 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 you know, you you've awakened me to some things that I might not have seen. So thank you for that, Lisa and others. Um, and I'm wondering whether, and this might be a complete. Well, I'm just going to say it. Could we pass this as an interim policy and then could take it to a board meeting sometime? I don't know when we're going to be able to do that because I think a lot of the board meetings are closed yet. Would would that be acceptable? Um, just in a show of faces, it doesn't look like it might be, but I can't read faces. But I, I would love to see something move forward that we can work with and test, um, knowing that we can come back to it as opposed to leaving us where we are now. But if we're out of meeting time, then it's going to be hard to discuss that. So that's true. I think that unless there's any amendments, it's time to take the vote. My hand was up. Oh, Sandra. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I. I really hope this passes because right now we really do have nothing. We, you know, the the grievance policy people, people have been really frustrated with that. They mostly have abandoned it in the middle of these long drawn out attempts to come to some kind of resolution. They've all failed and and it's just, you know, it's made things worse, you know, and we we've known that we've had this problem for a long time. And, you know, they've been working on this for a few years now. I think it started with Wally, actually, as I recall. And, you know, that's a long time. And I think this is a very good process. And when you, when you leave it open enough that um, people who are really engaged in dealing with the issues uh, between people can um, target the kind of responses that, you know, the interactions, you know, or, or the, you know, the kinds of actions that they need to take. I think you get a real personalized uh, and efficient, workable, low key attempt to resolve these things at the lowest level. And if you can resolve most of them, you know, maybe it's just, maybe the first you know, and I was reading the first one is a verbal warning. You know, you go to them and say, hey, you know, this is, you know, this is not working out. The second one is a written warning. Those are all really low key, easy to implement kinds of actions to take to try to resolve some of these problems. And then, you know, if you've got somebody, then there's ways that if there's a repeat offender in some way, then it then you're able to deal with it. But there's a lot of chances for people to learn what they're doing wrong 
And that's really complicating interactions and making them um, uncomfortable and 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 hurt and hurtful, you know. So I I really I think this is a good policy, you know, and I I, I you know, I there will be things to learn and maybe they'll want to add a few things, but I I really don't know what could be that much better than what there is. I really do hope. And I do think we need something. We need some way of dealing with these interpersonal issues before they completely blow up. You know, we've seen a plenty of that and they just don't need to get that um, out of whack before we're able to deal with it. And right now we have no way. We really, ha it, we really have nothing. So I really hope that people will, you know, if you're uncomfortable about about it, I hope you take a leap of faith and um, and let them do the work that they need to do to see if there are holes, what needs to be repaired in the policy, what needs, you know, what more it might need. And you really can't do that until you start implementing. It. So I really urge you to vote for this. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. We'll start the voting with you. I vote yes. John Alexander? Yes. Kevin? Yes. AJ? Yes. Tom? Yes. Sue? No. Paxton? No. Arna? Yes. Anne? No. John Silvermoon. No. George? Yes. Lisa? No. Motion does not pass. Can you read those votes out for the record? Sure can. Um, Tom is a yes vote. John Alexander is a yes vote. Arna votes yes. Sandra votes yes. Kevin votes yes. AJ votes yes. George votes yes. Sue votes no. Paxson votes no. Anne votes no. John Silvermoon votes no. Lisa votes no. That's it for old business. New business currently has the potential conflict of interest over the red sauna, the personnel policies committee appointment. I think that's all. And the bylaws. So there are three, the things, that will, there are three things that will come back under old business next month plus any other new business that is submitted to the board president between now and then. Thank you. Next up is the meeting evaluation. Last round for the good of the peach. Hands start with Lisa. Yeah, this isn't so much a evaluation. I should have probably announced this uh, during announcements, but there will be a board working session on Monday, April 17th on the new um, revised bylaws. The bylaws committee has been working on a comprehensive review and revision for a couple of years now, um, as directed by the board. And so we will be um, meeting with the board to um, to review everything and and hopefully get everybody's questions answered and um, work on anything that needs more work. Thanks, Lisa. John Alexander. Thanks for acknowledging my wonky hand. Um, I I hope I think that that we had really good discussion, and I my eyes were open to some things that I didn't see. So I re really appreciate that. I, I really am hoping that we can encourage ourselves as a board to encourage fair care to get into a session with us as soon as absolutely possible and get this thing 
right so we can all come together and put it forward because we haven't i i i'll, I'll leave it at that i'm not going to repeat what other people said but i think that these folks have put a lot of work into it and we owe it to them to give them the space to help us make this happen for them thanks john next is robbie Robbie, I just want to say I'm really disappointed in the decision. I think it's extremely risky. I think the actions, it's an action of an operational rather than a governance board. It's also incredibly disrespectful to the members of Fair Care to blindside us with these really critical concerns. I personally have spent hundreds of hours putting this together. I am tired. We heard one email with a couple of these concerns two days ago. What I heard tonight is mistrust and most obviously misunderstanding. If we knew these concerns existed, we could have hosted another engagement session to address those concerns. In the future, I hope you'll respect the time and the expertise of the individuals you asked to do any kind of work on behalf of the fair. AJ? Yeah. Um... I just, you know, it's, 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 I, I've been not only watching, but participating obviously in board meetings for a long time now. And uh, I, I just, I find it puzzling um, to see individuals um vote the way they do on 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 these things one way when it's their emotion and they're trying to convince somebody that you know all of the you know whether it was bylaws worked really hard or path planning or whatever the committee worked really hard and we should respect what they bring to the table and then the same people watch a group of folks work for more than a year on all of this and they had an opportunity to have maximum input and they wait until we get to a board meeting and all of a sudden it's <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm just I'm disheartened by the continuing um, not just conflict but dysfunction of this board of directors um, the fact that we are elected by the membership and we can't seem to get our stuff together and, and to do what is in the best interest of our membership in the best interest of our organization because what we have interpersonal conflict between board members who can't even though a policy may be good or bad oh, can't yeah. just just refuse to vote for somebody else's motion. Um, I find it just, it's sad. And the membership is watching this. I have conversations with them all the time. They watch this over and over and over again. And it does nothing good for this organization. And it does nothing good for the membership who invest all of their time and energy for this event with love and we talk about love and compassion for people not passing this tonight does not show love and compassion for people people that have been going through this broken process for years and years and years and they're looking for a remedy what do we do tonight we told them well sorry <laughs> we didn't come up with something perfect so you're stuck with the crap that's left in front of you. It's shameful. Martha? 
It's funny, but you're thinking when you put up your hand and then by the time it comes around to you, <laughs> the tone has changed a little bit. Um, I think some of what's happened is the shift from being an operational board to a policy board. And that when you're a policy, you, all of the people here have been involved in the fair and they want to think, what's it going to play out to be? What's it going to look like on the ground? What about the person who doesn't like their advocate? All those real things. And I'm sorry, but that's sort of none of your business anymore. <laughs> You're, we're talking about a policy, a higher level of how should we approach this? And so just, just my comment that I think these are some of the growing pains of shifting into being a policy board from a more operationally involved board. Thank you, Martha. Paxson? There it goes. Um, I hope this continues as a working session because I would like board working session because I would like to sit down and discuss it more. Uh, I really appreciate the work that's been done on it and I don't think it's a finished project, product, project or product. And so I hope we continue. I, as I said, I've sat through four rewrites of, uh, of the grievance policy. We had one in the uh, 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 2000s that actually worked pretty well. It wasn't until we manipulated it recently that it actually fell apart. Uh, it, uh, uh, so I hope this continues. I would like to see this work continue to work. I'd like to see this a little simplified. Uh, and you know, bylaws, that's what bylaws is doing. We're bringing it to a board working session uh, uh, with all the comments and things, the work that we've done to, uh, so that questions will show up, can show up there and we can work on them then. I, I wish we had done this with this. I hope we continue to do this uh, with a board working session coming up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. I really appreciate all the work done on this. Thank you. All right, just a reminder, we're on meeting evaluation here. Maybe I'm not entirely sure what that is. The first time I did this, I was pretty sure that it was a roast of me personally. Um, and now I'm thinking maybe it's something else. So just to round us all back to meeting evaluation here, Lisa. That's why I had my hand up. Um, I just wanted to comment on the meeting. Um, I think that, Al, I think you did a good job running the meeting. Um, it seems like everything went well technically. Um, we got everybody here on time. We got online smoothly. Um, I don't know how many folks are joining us on YouTube, um, but it seems like we have 44 folks here in the room with us now. And um, I just want to thank everybody who's here for um, just bringing your best self forward and participating. And, you know, it's not always fun. Sometimes it's really painful. Um, but thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Kevin? Um, I, too, I just want to thank everyone um, for being here, for their patience. Uh, thank you, Fair Cares, as well. And um, I guess we're not supposed to talk about Al, but I was going to say, you know, at some point, uh, I am not an expert in grievance. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in traffic. I'm not an expert in a lot of these things. And I think uh, it's beneficial for us all to allow all the experts of all the different area affairs of the fair to do their thing and give them the space and respect for that. And so, but yes, I appreciate everyone and all your, um, the conversations tonight. So thank you all very much. I uh, really like hearing, uh, having my mind, uh, you know, challenged about things and uh, it's been really good. So thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next, Lisa already mentioned, but the board work session uh, on bylaws is April 17th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. 
The next board meeting here will be on Monday, May 1st uh, at 7 p.m. Sorry, John, you have something you want to add? Yeah. Um, I respect everybody's opinion that was expressed, both those people who um, expressed opinions uh, complementary or or consistent with those that I was expressing on the issues tonight, as well as those people who were expressing opinions that uh, uh, were not consistent with the ones that I were expressing on any of the issues we discussed tonight. Um, I think it's important that we not attach motives um, to anything that anybody expressed tonight is this other a than the motive that i believe everybody had at this meeting of, of what looking for the best interest of the fair and the and 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 something that manifests um the values that we hold and i truly believe that everybody who spoke tonight spoke from that position in their hearts um and i i i I hope that others agree with me. Thank you. The last part of this is the president's piece. Thanks, Al. And a, a, a bunch of people stole my thunder. I really wanted to thank you. And, and I'm just really appreciative of your tone and your, um, your calmness and your ability to kind of keep track of things. It's, it's hard sometimes and you do a really masterful job. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, we, we started this meeting with a theme that kind of emerged about spring and we're into spring now. And I wanted to read just a final poem really quick, quickly to, um, to usher us out. Um, it's an anonymous poem, spring. The wind told the grass and the grass told the trees. The trees told the bushes and the bushes told the bees. The bees told the rain and the robins sang out clear, wake up, wake up, spring is here. Spring is here and the fair is right around the corner and um, I'm, I'm excited for everybody and I'm, I'm happy that we're, um, we're a family. So let's keep on keeping on. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Sam. And I will close it out with the uh, ceremonial Tibetan singing bowl. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Al, I like that move. That was uh, pretty special. Yeah. <laughs> You've been practicing. I'm seeing I, it. I practice so much. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm coming over, Al. We're going to practice. <laughs> <laughs> you rock, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah. See you, everybody. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Al. Thanks.